JFETs are sort of the next evolution, the next step up from regular BJT transistors. I wouldn't call them superior because there are things that BJTs do that no other transistor type does. Really the two common ones that are in use today that you'll see everywhere are BJTs and MOSFETs. MOSFETs are basically an advanced form of JFET, so JFET is a great place to start. Time for a 30 second review. N material is silicon that has been doped to be negatively inclined. P material is silicon that has been doped to be positively inclined. If you put a piece of N and P together, you get what's called a PN junction, and a diode, a regular one, is a PN junction. If you add another P or another N, you get an NPN or PNP BJT transistor. A JFET is also constructed from N and P materials, and it behaves in a similar way to a BJT transistor. You have three pins, Two of them are used to control the operation, and two of them pass the signal through. Now, a BJT technically has three, because you can bias back and forth the collector to base junction to get it between active and saturation mode. A JFET is a lot simpler. A JFET is basically all the way open, all the way closed, or something in between. It's much closer to a valve, like people love to use the analogy, than a BJT is. So here the valve analogy actually is halfway decent. Now I've mentioned MOSFETs, which we'll get into into the future, but basically think of MOSFETs as special JFETs. MOSFETs are much much more common because they are more advanced than a JFET at pretty much everything a JFET does. But JFETs are still worth looking at, if for no other reason than to understand the MOSFET. So JFET stands for Junction Field Effect Transistor. Let's not get into too much detail why that is, let's just look at one. Now you will find many different drawings of these on the internet. There's more than one way to build them, but it's all basically the same principle. Instead of stacking the materials on each other, you actually make a channel, a river, a pipe, whatever you want, of one material, and then surround it with the other. I'm going to talk about N-channel JFETs, just like for BJTs and for pretty much every transistor type, the P version is pretty much the same thing except with the voltages reversed. The thing is, the N-channel JFET is already so flexible that the P1 doesn't do anything new. Unlike a PNP versus NPN transistor, which is an incredibly useful difference sometimes, from what I've read, there's pretty much never, almost never, a reason to use a P-channel. There may be some specialized thing, but everything I've read, it's just not useful. And also, it can't pass as much current through it. So the N-channel JFET is pretty much what you're going to see. So we're going to ignore the P1. It's just reversed, basically. So imagine, if you will, something like this. Let's say this is P material, and this is a cross-section. So this is supposed to be the casing, the outer container, all made of P material. Let's say we've got another chunk here that's also P. So what we have is a channel here. Go from here to here. Now, we have two contacts. These are just, you know, contact points. They're not NRP material. They're just spots. Similarly, we have one here on the P. So these two are directly connected to the channel. This one is attached to the P and it's all around the outside. It's basically the casing connection. It's not just one little spot here. Inside is N material. The entire thing, this is why it's called an N channel. The channel is made of N material surrounded by P material. Now, these three pins are the drain, the gate, and the source. This is the same as an NPN transistor where you have the collector, the base, and the emitter. They don't work the same way, but they basically are conceptually the same. The gate, like the base of an NPN transistor, is the control nodule. This is how you change how the transistor is working. And then the current goes from drain to source. Now, one tricky thing. You may notice this is pretty symmetrical. And yes, it is. You can run this both ways. You can technically run a BJT transistor both ways as well. For various reasons, you shouldn't with a BJT. There is some trickiness involved, but 
With this one, it actually is perfectly fine to use either the drain or source. You could just say this is the source and this is the drain. This is always the gate, but it doesn't matter which one you call which, as long as you pick one and stick with it. Now check your spec sheet. My spec sheet for the ones I have specifically says drain and source interchangeable. Sometimes they're not for various reasons. It might be better to construct it a certain way for performance, for stability, protection, because JFETs are more susceptible to dying due to electrostatic sparks from touching it than BJTs are. BJTs are pretty hard to kill. JFETs are much less hard to kill. MOSFETs need their own fainting couches. So it's more delicate, so you may have one that's constructed to be less delicate, but it might lock in one of these two. But my spec sheet says you can do it either way. So what happens is you apply a voltage from source to gate. So the source is connected to the N channel. The gate is connected to the P material around that channel. Remember, a diode is a PN junction. To forward bias a diode, you connect positive to P, negative to N. We're doing it the opposite here. We're connecting positive to the N, negative to the P, which means the gate source voltage is negative. It's always the direction that you say the letters in, the VGS. VGS, measured from gate to source, well, source is higher than gate, so it's going to be a negative number. So, what we have is a PN junction that we're reverse biasing. In a diode and a BJT, that creates a depletion layer, as it does here. The depletion layer, I should mention you also apply a high voltage here and a low voltage here, because your voltage goes from drain to source, whichever one you pick is drain and source. So you get a large depletion layer over here and a smaller one over here. But we don't need to go too much into the physical details. Just basically, you have your gate source junction is controlling a depletion layer. Now, if this voltage, if this gate to source voltage is low or zero, let's say zero, let's say you're not putting one across, then what you have is just the natural depletion layer that forms, sort of like the forward voltage drop of diode. There is a small depletion layer that just forms. If you reverse bias this junction, it gets bigger and bigger, the depletion layer gets bigger, and it chokes off the current until something called the pinch voltage, like pinch, and you can't get through anymore. So if you apply enough voltage, the transistor turns off. This is why it's called a depletion mode transistor. Normally it's on. Normally you just can hook up wires, drain to source, and it'll just go through with a limit. There's a maximum amount of current that can go through at all in any situation. Now, if you bias gate to source forward, if you apply a higher voltage here than here, just like a diode, you will shrink the depletion layer, the natural one that forms by default, you'll shrink it. But the problem is this is a very delicate situation. If you have pretty much any current going from gate to source at all, you're gonna fry the thing. So technically you could get maximum current through the thing by shrinking it just a little bit, uh, but that's playing with a knife's edge. It's not really worth it. So we always assume we're not doing that. We always assume by default it's open as much as it's going to be, and then we apply a voltage to pinch it shut. So it's normally on, pinch it shut to turn it off. So enough of the physical details. Let's look at a simpler block diagram. Drain, gate, source. Now you might say, if you're supposed to put a positive here and a negative here, and a positive here and a negative here, that doesn't make any sense. Well, there's three ways you can do it. First of all, you could use two different power supplies. As I've demonstrated in another video, you could put five to zero of one supply, and then five to zero of the other, and it'll work fine. A second way is you could put five here, and two here, and zero here. So this is higher than this, and this is higher than this, if that works for your circuit. But one common way it's done is you add a resistor. So if you put a resistor connected to negative, then what happens is you've got a voltage drop across the resistor. So this is going to let a certain amount of current through. Ohm's law, current, multiply current times resistance, and you get the voltage drop of this resistor. And then this terminal is going to be higher. So let's say the voltage drop ends up being one, and this is five. So this will be one here. And then you could put zero here. And to turn it off, you could put one here. So it's one and one, which is zero voltage across that junction. So that's the three ways to do it. If you have two power supplies, just hook it up and don't worry about it. If you don't need the full voltage through, you can split it in half. Or with a single supply, you can use a resistor so that this gate is above zero, which does, in effect, cut your voltage. So this is pretty much the first thing I said anyway. But it's good to look at things in two different ways. So this is our source. Now, there are two physical properties I want to talk about. The first 
is labeled IDSS. I stands for current, just the standard letter. DS is drain to source. And the last S is saturation. Basically, if you put a voltage, forget the gate for a minute. If you put a voltage from drain to source, it's going to let through a certain amount of current. If you increase the voltage really, really high without breaking it, it's still going to let through a certain maximum current. It's just, it can handle, it can let through a certain amount of current and that's it. And we use the gate to source to change that amount. But if we have zero, no voltage across gate to source, it's default state, just the depletion layer that's there naturally. IDSSS, SSSSS, is the current that you can get the flow through it at maximum. Keep turning the voltage up all you want, you'll get that much. And that'll be in your spec sheet. Now in your spec sheet, it'll be a range. It'll say minimum, maximum, and typical. And you'll have to, if it matters, measure every single one individually, because differences in manufacturing will cause different values. If all you care is approximate values, which often we do, especially if you're using them as a switch, then all you care is if they're off and on. You don't care about all the details in between. You can just go on your spec sheet and look at for the typical values. But in this case, the maximum current that will go through if there's no voltage here, just by default, is ID SSSSSS. The other one is VP, the voltage of pinching. Now, the voltage of pinching is when you've applied enough voltage to the gate to source to pinch this off. Some current will still flow, minuscule. Basically, we say no current is flowing. If it's pinched, we say it's off. So VP is the voltage you have to apply across gate to source to pinch it. So you go from maximum current allowed with no voltage to effectively no current allowed at the pinch voltage. Now this is defined only when gate to source voltage is zero in your spec sheet. But wait, that is the gate to source voltage you say. It's actually this voltage here as well. Give me a second, I'll get there. But basically, if there's no gate to source voltage, then VP is the voltage across drain to source that you have to apply to get the full current to flow. If you apply less, then you'll get less current than the maximum despite there being zero voltage. This is what's called the ohmic region. If you have a certain amount of voltage or more going through this, it's in what's called saturation. Turning up the voltage any more will not increase the current. But below the pinch voltage, turning the voltage up and down below the pinch voltage will also turn the current up and down. I think I said voltage and current. Anyway, you get the idea. When you are applying gate to source voltage to partially pinch it, then the amount of current you have to put through drain to source to get to that saturation is lower. You get to saturation easier, faster, but the maximum current is also reduced. And it's generally still called VP, unfortunately, but I'll give you a formula in a second. Right now, just think of this as the maximum current the thing will allow by default, and think of this as the voltage required to reach that current by default. These are both the things you'll find in your spec sheet, and sometimes it'll be called VGS off. So here, if you apply the voltage across gate to source, this value, you'll pinch off the current, and applying voltage across drain to source won't do anything. Or you can view it as how much voltage you need to get to IDSSS with gate to source as zero. There is a symmetry here that will be more clear as soon as I write some more stuff. So. Drain to source saturated current, look at your spec sheet or measure it. The pinch voltage or the GS off voltage, look in your spec sheet or measure it. So that's all you need to know. One current and one voltage. There's actually surprisingly little math here. Most of what I'm doing is just explaining an excruciating detail that's putting you all to sleep. Four pages and I've only got a couple equations on here. Very short ones too, trust me. It's all theory. So let's look at the gate to source voltage here. Let me write this smaller in the corner. Drain, source, gate. I'm going to try to not walk in front of it, but don't worry, it's just a reminder. So let's talk about the gate to source voltage. That is V, G, S. Now remember, it's going to be negative because it's from gate to source, but we're applying a higher voltage to source than gate. So VGS is going to be a negative number normally. So here's a set of inequalities. We say VGS min. That's not in your spec sheet specifically. This is just a name I came up with. Less than or equal to VP, less than or equal to zero, less than or equal to VGS max. All right, VP and zero is all you really need to care about. But 
VGS min, remember, because it's a negative number, so minimum is more negative, lower is more negative, smaller is more negative. VGS min is the name I've come up with to say, don't put a more negative voltage than this or you'll fry it. You go in your spec sheet, you see maximum ratings, that's what it's telling you. So right here is saying, okay, if you go lower than this, it's fried, don't do that. So that's the danger zone. Between the pinch voltage and VGS min. So basically, you've reached the pinch voltage, but you haven't reached the voltage that's gonna fry it. This is the useless range. Because it's already pinched, it's not gonna pinch more. So it's perfectly fine to operate it in this range. If you're using it as a switch, just stick it somewhere in there to turn it off. If this is two volts and this is nine volts, you can do five and don't worry about it. Minus five, rather. But I just want to point this out. If you're lower than the pinch voltage, but still not breaking it, you're not doing anything, but it's fine. Zero to VP, whatever VP is, is the normal range, active range, useful range. This is where things happen that we'll worry about. This is all you actually need to know about. This is what we'll get to in a minute. VGS max is what I said before. Remember how I said you could actually forward bias the gate to source junction and get rid of the tiny bit of depletion layer that's there by default? That's what I'm calling VGS max. This is not technically going to break it. As long as you haven't gone beyond what you need to get rid of that depletion layer. As long as you're not actually putting current through the gate. If you're applying a voltage that doesn't get rid of the depletion layer or gets rid of it just barely, then no more than a trickle is going through. But if you do more than that, you've got a bad thing. So this is the voltage to get rid of that depletion layer and get the tiniest bit of greater current through. There's no reason to do that. You're just going to risk breaking the thing when somebody farts upstairs and causes a power surge and your voltage goes a little too high, there goes your JFET. But I just want, for completeness sake, to say there it is. And then above VGS Max, you're frying it, don't worry about it. So, in reality, this is what we're actually doing. VGS is zero, VGS is the pinch voltage, according to the spec sheet in your testing, or it's anything in between. That's where it's useful. So that's what we're going to talk about. That's the gate to source voltage applied this way. And yes, in a P-channel it'd be the other way, but we're not worrying about P-channels. So that was the possible operating modes of the transistor based on gate to source voltage, which we have now narrowed down to one useful, from zero to the pinch. So now let's talk about the drain to source voltage. So we're controlling how much it is or it is not pinched off with gate to source. Now we have drain to source. So gate to source is the control voltage. These devices are voltage controlled, as you can see, rather than current controlled, like BJTs are. Drain to source voltage is the actual throughput main current voltage. That's the thing you're doing. Gate to source is how you control the thing you're doing with drain to source. So as much as I hate the water analogy, drain to source is the pipe, gate to source is the valve you turn. That's enough of that. So the voltage from drain to source, voltage drain to source, has its own operating ranges, just like before. And this is going to be positive now because we're saying drain to source and we're going in order of drain to source. So zero, less than or equal to Vsat, another name I came up with, less than or equal to VDS max. Voltage from drain to source. If it's less than zero, it's negative, which means it's going backwards. You can do that. Don't. There's no reason to. Perhaps in the future, if it's ever useful, just like the reverse mode of BJTs, there may be something it's useful for. If you want it to go physically the other way, if you want to use different pins and you have an interchangeable one, just use different pins. That's fine. Or just turn the thing around. There's no real reason to flip the current. Just put the current through that way. So... We're going to say zero is the lowest. So if you're putting no voltage across, obviously we're getting no current. Vsat is how much voltage you have to apply from drain to source to reach the point at which increasing it won't increase the current anymore. It's at saturation. You've gotten as much current out of it as you're going to. Going from there to this doesn't do anything. Increase the voltage past saturation, current doesn't increase. Again, if this is 2 and this is 9, you can put 5 here, like you're using logic switches, and it's perfectly fine. It's just not going to do anything. VDS max is what I'm calling the break voltage. If you put more than VDS max across there, you break it. That's in your spec sheet under the maximum ratings. So, once again, this is the useful range. We're applying no voltage to get no current. We're applying the saturation voltage to get the maximum current or something in between. And again, if you go over it, it's just saturated. That's fine. What is Vsat? Vsat. Once again, I came up with that name. A lot of references just say VP, which is dumb because that's confusing. I'm trying to be less confusing here. This is meaningful. It's the voltage that gets you to saturation. Doesn't that make sense? Why can't we use things like this? Why do we have to use all these funky names when we could just say the voltage at which you saturate? 
exaggerate. Ah! Anyway, it's V, G, S, minus V, P. V, G, S is the current value, whatever you are actually applying to G, S. And V, P is the number in the spec sheet. So V, P is how much G, S voltage will pinch it off completely. Or, when there's zero, it's how much to get saturation. So as you can see, first of all, this is once again in the range, zero greater than or equal to VGS, greater than or equal to VP. If VGS is greater than zero, then you're doing it wrong. If VGS is less than VP, it's not useful. This is just the normal operating range, zero to VP I mentioned. So just to make sure we remember we're in this normal range where we're not doing anything funky. So remember, these are both negative. So VGS, let's say VP is three, minus three. So you have to do minus three volts across here to pinch it off. Well, let's say we have VGS at zero. Well, zero minus minus three is three. So see, now it's positive and the DS is positive. So if VGS is at zero, zero, we're not doing VGS here, then VSAT equals VP, except it's not negative anymore, which is what I said before, remember. The voltage here to pinch off the channel is the same as the voltage here to get the maximum current flow if GS is zero. There's this symmetry, and this is the symmetry. The actual formulas have 800 million terms and they're all gross, but if you're not operating at 800 gigahertz in a pacemaker or a space shuttle, you don't care. It's gonna be lost in the noise. So for people like you and me, it's this. So this is the relationship. The closer VGS is to VP, the lower the saturation voltage is, all right? Remember that. So that's what VSAT is. It depends on VGS. If VGS equals VP, well, a thing minus a thing is zero, VSAT is zero. So already with zero voltage, you're already at saturation. So it doesn't matter if you apply any voltage, it's already saturated at zero current. So you can see that VSAT goes from zero to VP. Nice and easy. And just remember VGS and VP are negative for an N channel and VSAT, VDS is positive just because that's the way they refer to it. So let me put this formula up here for reference, VSAT equals VGS minus VP. Because now we want to know how much current is going through. We know what the voltage is doing. We need to know how that affects the current. So now we get back our other friend, IDSSSSS. So there are two regions, you might say, the ohmic and the saturation region. VSAT, remember we're referring to VDS here. All of this is referring to VDS. So if VDS has reached VSAT, you're in saturation. That's easy. If VDS is not reaching VSAT, then we have what's called the ohmic region. And in the ohmic region, it's kind of like a variable resistor. Your VDS, your VGS control the current. So if you were to say, put a VDS low enough and then turn VGS up and down, it would basically change the current as if it was a variable resistor. That's why they're called a variable resistor. But let me talk about saturation first, because saturation is one number. Once you get the saturation, you have a current and that's it. I, D. This is the current going in the drain. Because remember, you got gate to source, and this is really high impedance. There is a current, but it's micro, maybe nano amps. In a MOSFET, it's more like pico amps, but it's basically so small, we just say it's not there. Just, just pretend for all intents and purposes, there is no current through gate and source, so drain is the current. Unlike a BJT, where the base has measurable current, this one has irrelevant current. So the drain current, which is what we care about because that's the thing we're passing through to power our device, equals I, D, S, S. I can actually say it right when I'm writing the S's individually, times one minus V, G, S over V, P. So once again, we have set V, G, S and we have set V, D, S. These are our voltages. V, G, S determines what our VSAT is, right? The gate to source voltage is telling us what voltage across drain to source we need to reach saturation. So as long as we have at least that, as long as we have at least VSAT for VDS, then this holds true. This is only for saturation. Then the current, which is going to be at VSAT or higher, turn it up, it's not gonna increase it, it's saturated. Equals IDSS, I'm actually trying, is the number in the spec sheet or we measure it or whatever. That's just a constant, essentially. No matter what all the voltages are, that's a constant. So then we have this. VGS is the current value of GS and VP is, again, the set number. And you notice it's here. This VGS, VP, it's the same. So if VGS is zero, no voltage. So zero over something that's not zero is zero. One minus zero is one. One times anything is that thing. So the drain current equals the drain to source saturate current, which makes sense. 
means. This is how we defined it. IDSS is the current that goes to drain to source at saturation if gate to source voltage zero. Just that's how we defined it, so that makes sense. What if VGS equals VP? Well, VGS and VP are both negative, but a negative divided by a negative is a positive, and it's also one. In fact, it doesn't matter. It's one. Same number divided by same number is one. One minus one is zero. Times anything is zero. The drain current is zero. When gate to source voltage is the pinch voltage that we have measured or defined in the spec sheet, then it's pinched, no current. Approximately, there's a trickle, we're ignoring it. So again, this is how you get it. We go from the saturation current to no current based on this pinching it off. It's really that simple. There it is. This is the voltage to reach saturation. It just depends on your gate to source voltage. This is the current you get when you do it. Now what about the ohmic region? For this I'll just draw a quick graph. Don't worry about it too much. This will be short and painless, I promise. So you have an axis here and an axis here. This axis here is the voltage drain to source, the voltage across here. So you can have zero volts across it or as many volts as you want across it. This axis is I of D. This is the drain current. This is actually a 3D graph, but I'm drawing it in 2D, so we have to do multiple curves, but it'll be quick. So the voltage across drain to source is this axis, from zero to whatever, and the current going through the transistor from zero to whatever. So let me draw this. So at about this point, you'll see, kind of flattens out. That's saturation. So here is VP. Right now we're assuming the voltage from gate to source is zero. So we're at zero here. So there's our pinch and the current doesn't get any higher. In fact, it's I, D, S, S. We'll pretend that's an S. So you can see when you're at the pinch voltage through drain to source, remember, those two are proportional. It's not just the pinch voltage, it's also Vsat. Then you have your saturation, and if you keep turning the voltage up, you still get the same current. Over here, this is the ohmic region. This over here is what's called the ohmic region. You'll notice that as we maintain the voltage from gate to source the same at zero, and we turn up and down the voltage from drain to source from zero to VP, then we change the current. Near zero, it's actually pretty linear. So if you can deal with very small currents, you have a linear, roughly, variable resistor. Otherwise, you have a nice curved one. But basically, you can see that the voltage just controls the current through. So that's why they call it the ohmic region, because conceptually, it could be seen as a variable resistor. Now, what if I change these values? So this was our first curve. That is VGS equals zero. Now, what is the curve of VGS equals VP. Well, it's here. It's pinched. No current at all. So just this line, which since I'm not a draftsman is close enough to zero, is your VGS equals VP line. That's not useful. We know what it is. But what about this? What's this line? Zero greater than or equal to VGS greater than or equal to VP. Voltage from gate to source is somewhere between zero and the pinch. In your spec sheet, you're going to see several of these lines in a chart sort of like that, just to kind of give you an idea. But basically, this is the maximum, and then you're going to have ones that shrinks it. Let me actually draw this line better so it's more clear. Because what's supposed to happen is, see it flattens out. This one flattens out here. This one flattens out here. So this is VP, and this is IDSS. I suppose I erased more than I needed to. And you're going to get a line like this. This is VSAT. VSAT. See down here? Remember how we had VSAT going between zero and VP? That's what VSAT is. We get there sooner if we're partially pinching it off, but the actual current is lower as well. And we have a different ohmic region as well. If we're below saturation, we can turn down the voltage. But the highest voltage is still going to be lower than VP. So that's what the characteristics curves are. That's what they call them. So when you look in your spec sheet and you see a graph like this, this is what it's telling you. For any particular gate to source voltage, you'll have one of these lines. On that line, you'll see a curve and then it'll flatten out. The point at which it starts flattening out, that's the saturation. When it's not flattened out, that's your ohmic region, where conceptually it's a variable resistor. And the more pinched off it is, the earlier that VSAT comes until V sets at zero with VGS equals VP. It's really quick and easy. I've just explained it six times because it's taken me over a week to understand this in all its detail. Hopefully, a nice half hour to hour video, hopefully it's not that long, but we'll see, will be enough for you. You'll see something called transconductance gain. We'll get into that later. Ooh, 
that's a nest of snakes. But you don't really need it. Advanced electronics will need it. Doing super fancy things with JFETs will need it. But we really don't need it here. Basically, you can be saturated or you can be not saturated. And you understand the two behaviors. If you're saturated, you get a current. If you're not saturated, you can change the current. That's it. That is it. And let me just quickly show you one more thing you'll see in the spec sheet called a transfer curve because they wanted to call it that. It's not a wrong name, it's just not obvious. So now we have an axis like this. This is VGS. Remember VGS is zero to negative because it's going this way even though we labeled it this way. That's why the zero points here. So this is zero and that's more negative. And then here is I D. So this is purely saturation. This is all saturation mode. So we always assume no matter what this is, no matter what the saturation voltage across drain to source is, we assume we have it. We assume we're always got enough voltage across drain to source to get maximum current. So this is just showing us what maximum current is. And again, when the gate to source voltage is zero, it's going to be at its maximum. It's going to be as high and it'll actually be touching the axes. But when VGS is zero, we're at maximum current, ID equals IDSS. And then when VGS goes down to VP, so here's IDSS. When VGS goes down to VP, the current minus my drawing goes to zero. So this is just showing you the shape of the curve, if you happen to need to know that. I would find it easier just to measure because every transistor is going to have a slightly different number anyway because of variances in manufacture. But if you just want to see, oh, it goes up much more sharply towards VGS equals zero, then that's what it's showing you. This is called the transfer curve in the spec sheets I see. Now I was going to go into actually using these things, but this video has become horrendously long, I'm sure. So I'm going to cut it off and I'm going to do future videos on actually using them in different ways. There's only one quick thing I'm going to mention, so it's fresh in our minds. So you know we have our drain, our gate, and our source. So we have the drain to source voltage applied that way, high and low. And we have our gate to source voltage applied this way, high to low. So if gate to source is zero, current is flowing through. If we turn gate to source, well, down since it's negative, it'll pinch it off and it'll stop conducting. Now, according to my sources and a little bit of my testing, there is funkiness with this. There is a sort of stickiness to the depletion layer in this device. When you apply a gate to source voltage and then you remove it, when you apply a drain to source voltage and you remove it, it tends to stick a little bit. So what you actually do is you have a resistor and the resistor just goes from source to gate or I should say between source and gate because it does not have a polarity and this is independent of any signal. This has nothing to do with the signal you're sending. This is just a resistor you connect and you leave it there. So what happens is when you change the voltages, it has a path for the current to flow to equalize its internal mechanisms. It flows through the resistor so that it's not a short circuit and the JFET works. Without this resistor, the JFET gets sticky and does work. It does work. It just works really poorly. But if you stick it on there, it works great. And of course, the size of the resistor affects how fast the current goes through the resistor, which affects how fast it equalizes. So you can have a bigger resistor to waste less energy as heat and to not overheat the resistor, but that will also slow it down. So it depends on how fast you need it to move. It depends on if you're operating in kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz. But that's just a caveat that we'll get into in a future video, so you don't need to remember that right now. I just wanted to mention it before I leave that that's a weirdness that you don't need to use in MOSFETs as far as I know. I'm continuing to do research, but I think you don't need that in MOSFETs. If I'm wrong, I'll let you know then. So while I go spend the rest of this night editing the video, I'll be seeing you.